this section, we're going to be looking at inverse functions. And out of that section, we're going to be verifying inverse functions. We're going to be finding the inverse of a function and also use the horizontal line test to determine if a function has an inverse function. Okay. Now, let's look at what an inverse function is. We're going to let two functions, f and g, they're going to be two functions such that the composition of f with g of x or f of g of x is equal to x for every domain, every x in the domain of g, and g of f of x, so the composition of f with g of x is equal to x for every x in the domain of f. And the function g is considered to be the inverse of the function f, and it's going to be denoted by a little f with a negative 1, and we read that as f inverse, not f to the negative 1, f inverse. Okay. All right, now let's look at some examples. Well, one example that deals with uh, finding, determining whether two functions are inverses of each other. Okay. Here I want to show that each function is the inverse of the other. In this case, I get f of x is equal to 4x minus 7, and g of x is equal to x plus 7 over 4. So I have two functions, and I want to determine if f and g are inverses of each other. Okay. Now, this is by the definition here, so we're going to have to use the composition of f with g of x and the composition of g with f of x. They both must be equal to the same. If they are, then we can say that those two functions are inverses. If they're not the same, then they're not inverses. So here, we'll start with the comp well f of g of x. Now, g of x in this case is x plus 7 over 4, so I'm going to be evaluating f of x plus 7 divided by 4. Now, my f of x function is 4x minus 7. So this is what f of x is, 4x minus 7. And I'm evaluating f of 4x minus 7. I mean x plus 7 over 4. I'm sorry. f of x plus 7 over 4 is what I'm evaluating. So that means in place of this x in the f of x function, I'm putting g of x in its place. So this x will be replaced with x plus 7 over 4. And then I'm going to simplify. These 4's divide out. I'm going to have x plus 7 minus 7. And then these 7's will, divide, will give me 0, so I'm left with just x. So the composition of f with g of x is x. Now i got to do the composition of g with f of x. That's g of f of x. And it must also give me x. If it does, then those two functions, f and g, will be inverses. If the composition of g with f of x gives me something else other than x, then I can say those two functions can't be inverses. So for g of f of x, well, here f of x is 4x minus 7, so I'm going to be evaluating g of 4x minus 7. Now, my g of x function is x plus 7 over 4. And I'm evaluating g of 4x minus 7. Here, I replace this x with the g of x. That means I'm replacing this x in the g of x function with f of x. So in this case, that's 4x minus 7 and then plus 7 all over 4. 
because the rest of this is part of g of x. And then the sevens give me zero, so I'll have four x divided by four, and these fours divide out, you're left with x. Now compare the composition of f with g of x, which is x, and the composition of g with f of x. That's also equal to x. They're both the same. So I can conclude that these two functions, f and g, are inverses. That means f is the inverse of g and g is the inverse of f. Okay. So that's how you determine whether two functions are inverses of each other. You have to do the composition of f with g of x and the composition of g with f of x. Okay. All right, the next thing we'll look at is, let's say you're only given a function f of x, and you want to find the inverse of that particular function. Okay, you're only given a function, f of x equal to something, and then you want to find what f inverse is going to be. All right, th here's the four-step procedure that you'll use. Number one, you're going to replace f of x with y in the equation. You replace the f of x with the y in the equation. Then the second step will be to interchange x and y. And then third, solve the equation for y. And then finally, replace the y in step three with f inverse of x. Okay, so that's basically what you're going to be doing in this particular case. When you're given just f of x equal to an expression and you want to find out what f inverse is going to be, this will be the procedure that you'll use. And here, we're going to look at a few examples that are like that. Okay. Let's say we had this function. Just give me a minute here. Alright, let's say we had this function. We want to find the inverse of this function, f of x, is equal to 2x plus 7. And here we want to find out what f inverse of x is going to be. So here we're going to find the inverse of this function, f of x is equal to 2x plus 7. The first step is to replace this f of x with y. So here this will become y equals 2x plus 7. Then the next step, you're going to interchange the x and the y. In other words, this y becomes your x and this x becomes y. So here this will be x equals 2y plus 7. And then the third step would be to solve this equation for y. You need to get this y by itself. So let's first subtract 7 on both sides of this equation. So that means we're going to have x minus 7 is equal to 2y. And then to get the y by itself, you're divide, well, you're multiplying by 2, so you want to divide both sides by 2. So this will be y is equal to x minus 7, and the whole thing is over 2. Okay, that equation is solved for y. Now the final step is to replace this y with f inverse of x. So f inverse of x would be this equation, x minus 7 all over 2. Okay, so this equation, x minus 7 over 2, represents what f inverse of x is. Okay. All right, another example would be, would be this one. All right, let's say we want to find the inverse of this function. Let's say f of x is equal to 
4x cubed minus 1. f of x is equal to 4x cubed minus 1. And we want to find out what f inverse is. All right, we still use that four-step procedure. We, we first replace the f of x with y. So you're going to have y is equal to 4x cubed minus 1. And then the next step would be to interchange the x and the y. So this y becomes x and the x becomes y. So you have x is equal to 4y cubed minus 1. And then we want to solve for y. Okay, let's get the y cubed by itself by just adding 1 to both sides. So now you're going to have x plus 1 is equal to 4 y to the third. And then to get the y to the third by itself, you're going to divide both sides by 4. So you'll have y cubed is equal to x plus 1 divided by 4. Now we want to solve for y. It's being cubed, so the opposite of cubing something would be taking the cube root on both sides of this equation. And all of this is x plus 1 over 4. All that's underneath the cube root. So the cube root of y to the third is simply going to be y. Now this expression, we'll just have to rewrite that as the cube root of x plus 1 all over 4. And that whole expression is underneath the radical. Okay. So this equation is solved for y. The next step would be to replace the y with f inverse. So here, f inverse of x would be this, ex this expression, the cube root of x plus 1 all over 4. And that part, right, this right here, represents f inverse of x. Okay, and I'll do one more of uh, uh, finding the inverse of a function. Okay, let's say we have this. Let's say we want to find the inverse of this particular function. f of x is equal to 3 over x. and then minus 1. f of x is equal to 3 over x, and then minus 1. This is not hard. We just start by replacing the f, f of x with y. So we're going to have y is equal to 3 over x minus 1. And then the next step would be to interchange the x and the y. So this y becomes x and the x becomes y. So you'll have x is equal to 3 over y minus 1. Now the next step would be to solve this equation for y. Notice that the y is in the denominator. So I'm going to get rid of that by multiplying each and every term in this equation by y. Okay, I'm just eliminating the uh, y that's in the denominator by just multiplying each and every term by y. So on the left side I'm going to have xy and that's equal to these y's are going to divide out I'm going to be left with 3 minus y. Now what I'm going to do here is get all the y's on one side of this equation. So what I'm going to do here is add y to both sides So here, these are two totally different terms here. So I'm going to have xy plus y is equal to 3. Now notice on the left side, xy plus y, those two terms have a common factor of y. So let's factor out the y. And what I'm going to have inside the parentheses is this. xy divided by y will just simply be x plus y divided by y by itself, y divided by y, that's going to be 1. So I'm going to have y times the quantity x plus 1 
equals to 3. And then get that y by itself is, is being multiplied by x plus 1, so let's divide both sides by x plus 1. And then I'm going to continue this over here. So I'm going to have y is equal to 3 over x plus 1. So that equation is solved for y. Now, we'll replace the y with f inverse. So f inverse of x will be 3 over x plus 1. Okay, so that would be my final answer right there. F inverse of x is equal to 3 over x plus 1. Okay. All right, now the next thing we'll look at is the horizontal line test. If, we, if you recall, we talked about the vertical line test, where you use that to determine whether a particular graph will have a function. Here, the horizontal line test determines whether or not that particular graph has an inverse function. Okay, now a function f has an inverse, that is a function f inverse, if there is no horizontal line that intersects the graph of the function f at more than one point. Okay, that's very important because if the graph, if that horizontal line intersects the graph at more than one point, then that means that particular graph, there is no inverse function for that graph. Look at the two in the middle. These two are not, do not have inverse functions because the horizontal line crossed the graph at two different places here. And on this one, it's crossing the, the horizontal line crossed the graph at three different places. So those two would not have an inverse function. This first one and the last one would, because I can draw a horizontal line anywhere on that graph, and it's going to cross the graph at only one place. And the same holds true with this last one on the end. So those two, A and D, would have inverse functions. Now let's look at this example. Let's say we want to refer to the graph to determine which ones represent functions that have inverse functions. Let's look at the first graph right here. That's this popular V-shaped graph. It looks like the absolute value function graph. If I draw a horizontal line through that graph, you're going to see that a horizontal line crosses the graph at two different places. So this particular graph will have no inverse. Because it's crossing the graph at two different places. The one in the middle, if I draw a horizontal line here, it's only crossing the graph at one place. Or I can draw a horizontal line up here. It's crossing the graph at only one place. So this one has an inverse. And for this one, this last one, notice if I draw a horizontal line through that graph, it's only crossing the graph at one place. So this too has an inverse. Okay, so be familiar with using the horizontal line to determine whether a graph would have an inverse function. Okay, so that will conclude this particular section on inverse functions.